Greetings. Welcome to day 16 of the 30 days of Halloween. Today, I'm going to be discussing some of the stuff that we find creepy and maybe figure out why we find them creepy. What do I mean by that? Well, this is the time of the year if you go into the stores, everything is done up for Halloween, of course. It has been for a while. Um, and my husband came home. He came home with a bag of Reese's peanut butter bats. Bats? Reese's peanut butter bats? And yes, they're mysteriously, they've been open. Um, they're little peanut butter, Reese's peanut butter cups. They have bats, they've got creepy bats on the wrapper. <gasps> Open it up. Does it look like a bat? It's supposed to look like a bat. It's supposed to look like a bat. <laughs> Truth be told, I think it looks like a turd. But it's a peanut butter, Reese's peanut butter cup. Just like always. Whoop! Oh, that hot Reese's peanut butter bats. That's not all. Found pretzels. Halloween pretzels. Spooky, spooky shapes. Spider webs and flying bats. Flying bat pretzels. With a lot of pretzels. Well, let's look at them. The spider webs look pretty cool. The bats look like um I guess it's this way. They kinda look like I don't even know if you can see it. <laughs> I don't know. Is it a bat? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'll put that with a peanut butter cup and give that to my husband. We even found veggie chips. Who doesn't like veggie chips? But these are special veggie chips because these are ghosts and bats. Ghosts and bats, and they're kind of cute. I don't know what they look like inside, but the picture on the bag is terrifically cute. If they look like that, I don't think they're spooky. But there's everywhere. Pinterest is covered with things that you can do that you can turn desserts and snack foods into bats and we see bat decorations everywhere. Even my stamp that I use, I have a rubber stamp when I do my a bullet journal every month. When I do my calendar and my bullet journal, I have a special stamp that I use for the, um, for the new moon. I'm digging in here. And a stamp I use a rubber stamp that I use for the full moon to mark that in my calendar. And even my full moon stamp, not sure why, but it has bats flying in the moonlight. We think bats are creepy. We think bats are creepy. They're everywhere in Halloween. What makes them creepy? Why, are we, why do we consider bats creepy? What is it is about them? Well, there's two things that come to mind. If you would do some research on bats, you find out two interesting facts. Number one, they're the only mammals who can fly. That's kind of, that's not creepy, but that's unusual. And that they're also the only mammal that can feed on blood. They can feed on blood. They can see in darkness, total darkness. They have very good, people think they're blind. They say blind is a bat. Bats are not blind. Bats can see very well. The bats have very, very good eyesight. That They even have like a radar kind of a thing going on. I guess it's not radar, it's like what's sonar. It's, I don't know, that makes them see, enables them to navigate in absolute darkness, but they can also see in absolute darkness. And you find them in dark places when they hibernate in the winter, particularly they'll hibernate in caves. I've told you stories about the bats that hang. It, when we go camping, there's a, a restroom, a public restroom at the park where we, where we camp that has, uh, <laughs> up in the rafters of the, of the restroom. 
bats hanging all over the <laughs> all over the ceiling, which are kind of cool. We're happy to see the bats because that bats eat mosquitoes. As a matter of fact, a bat can eat um, up to 1,200. Oh, is that even true? 1,200 mosquitoes in an hour. Somebody like me who's terrifically sensitive to mosquito bites. <laughs> very, very hypersensitive to mosquito bites. That's really good news to me. So I love to see bats wherever I go. Um, but I'll tell you, most people don't. Most people are scared of bats. And if you see any movie with a haunted Dracula's castle or any, you know, a haunted house or anything, or just a creepy night, what is the first thing that you see is bats. Why is that? We associate bats with vampire bats. We call them vampire bats. Well, you know, there is, um, I did some research on that. There's over 1,300 species of bats worldwide and only, uh, what? Only three, something like only three of those species are actually what you consider to be vampire bats. And they don't really live here in the United States. They live in Mexico, South and Central America, I believe. I don't know if any come here from Mexico. I know. I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. But, you know, they 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 can drink, the, you know, and they can bite. They can bite. But, you know, when we're afraid of the bats, when we see the bats, you think of the haunted castles. Even in even in Dracula's castle, is you know, you see these bats, and people think, what is it with the bats? And your first idea is that, oh, they're going to suck my blood. They're going to suck my blood. Don't suck my blood. Really, they're not going to suck your blood. <laughs> they're not going to suck your blood. Most of them do not. And um, if they did suck your blood, even the ones who suck the blood out of sleeping cattle or sleeping horses, the, the horse or the cow doesn't even really notice. It doesn't kill them. It just, that's how they feed. But, you know, if you're going to worry about anything with bats, you could worry about rabies. Like, I don't, you know, but only, to be honest, less than 1% of bats have rabies, carry rabies. So when you're running from them screaming, you know, <laughs> people aren't screaming about rabies, even though rabies is something you need to worry about a little more perhaps than them wanting to to suck your blood. But that's what we think about. The perception that they can do things that we can't see. We can't see them. Gives them some magical properties. That gives them magical properties because a lot of witches think that bats represent perception of things that we can't see. The, that idea of transition, um, maybe the idea of transition, um, maybe the idea of a new beginning. They might represent death, but in the same sense that we see death in the tarot representing, it's, it's, a, it's the transition from one, the end of one phase and the beginning of a new phase. The bat holds that kind of a um, the symbolism within 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 Mecca, particularly. Um, if you dream about bats, it's usually a sign of something around you is ending. Something around you maybe needs to end, and it's time to let it go and to build something new. So it's not bats are not necessarily something that we need to worry about. They're not necessarily creepy. I don't think they're necessarily creepy. I think they're kind of cool. But there is one part of them that some people consider something not to mess with. And in that, such, in that instance, they're kind of creepy. Okay. Where in the foods and things, they're creepy by association. This bat pretzel is creepy because of the association with the spider web. Or these crap, these goes, these bat veggie chips by association with the goat with the ghost veggie chips perhaps but that's on their own are they something to fear are they something to fear are they do we have any basis in them here i don't think so but we do use and we can see i'm going to i'm going to switch gears a little bit because i want to talk about one way that witches very much are interested in bats, true witches. And other than seeing, you know, the um, properties, the magical properties association, associated with bats that I just mentioned, um, we have 
for centuries been using something called bat blood ink, bat blood ink. Now we have different kinds of magical inks that we use in, in Wicca particularly, not just in Wicca, but in other, other magic, magic um, groups, metaphysical groups, whatever, use uh, different uh, kind of inks. And everybody's very familiar with something called Dragon's Blood Ink. I have some Dragon's Blood Ink here that I purchased. I've not made, I have made it, this I did not make, this I bought. Um, but there's something called Dragon's Blood Ink, which is used all the time for sealing, making promises, sealing documents, signing contracts, you know, signing um, contracts or promises, notes, promissory notes, or those kind of things, or, or um, using a spell, people write their spells with Dragon's Blood Ink a lot, when they really want to set their, their words, they really want to set intention into their words, they will use Dragon Blood Ink. There's something called Dove's Blood Ink. There's something called, I don't know what else. And also there's something called Bat Blood Ink, Bat Blood Ink. And I'm gonna make a little bit of Bat Blood here. I'm gonna experiment with it. I've never made Bat Blood before, but what would we use it for? A lot of people caution it, and this is what I wanna say. This is where I wanna <laughs> tie this into our topic today. Is it creepy or scary? A lot of people, there are people, when you do research on the internet for Bat's Blood Ink, First of all, I want to tell you it's not made with bat's blood. Let's be clear. It may have one time been made with bat's blood, but it's not anymore. It hasn't been for a long, long time. But it, um, some people don't want to mess with it. They find it, you know, it's supposed to be very good at, at removing. It's, first of all, if you want to hex somebody or curse somebody or, you know, write, like when you make a poppet, if you want to write on the poppet, and you're really mean business and you really want to hex or curse, which I do not advocate doing, but if you do that, that's blood ink is your ticket if you want to write on there. And for that very reason, it's very powerful ink, and for that very reason, some people say, please don't ever use it because it's just too powerful. You don't want to mess with it. Other people will give you the idea that it is really good for, if it's good for, setting a curse or setting a hex, it's good for removing a curse or removing a hex. Again, that might be very good use for it, but other people say, you know, it's a fine line. What if you're trying to remove that curse and you end up getting into some other kind of trouble? Some people really fear it. And in that sense, it's very creepy. <laughs> if, if an ink can be that powerful of a tool that it can have that kind of effect, I would find that fearful. For myself, I want to say that I believe my tools are only as powerful as I allow them to be. I ascribe the magic in my tools to my own magic, the power that I give, that I have, rather than the tool has power over me. That's my personal belief. Many people will not agree and I'm, that's fine I understand that but I think I'm, I, intention is everything to me so I don't fear it I would tend to use it if I wish to um, communicate with those in the other world those that have passed that's when I like to use it so that's why I'm bringing it up at this time of the year um, I mentioned the other day in a video if you want to connect with your ancestors, communicate with your ancestors, one simple way of doing it is to write them a letter and leave it out on your altar. And you might want to use bath blood ink for that. I Just like we use the magical chalk, remember I made the magical chalk that I will be writing out on the sidewalk messages for the dead, that's on Samhain, for them to read as they're passing by or in, <laughs> whatever, whoever they are. We want the, the ones that are mean mischief to go away. We don't want them here. But as far as I, the, I don't, I'm not worried about a curse. I'm just, that's me. But please use your own, please use your own judgment. That has to be your judgment. Okay. Now, um, I just want to show you, you know, I'm not a, I'm, I'm, I'm experimenting. I put the clip here. I've already made the ink. And I, but I made a clip, I made a little clip that I want to add, attach here to show you what I did. 
because I did a lot of research on making this ink. I have made inks in the past, medieval inks. You know, I do a little bit of calligraphy in, with the SCA. And this is an ink pot that holds some ink that I've made in the past. This holds ink that I made out of um, walnut husks and vinegar, basically. Um, it makes a nice, rich brown ink. It was very commonly used. You, you hear of um, oak gall ink. People think black ink was made of just oak galls, but no, black walnut husks, walnut husks use a lot for inks. And it makes a beautiful ink. And I've made that, and I've also made a red ink. I don't have any of that, but I made a really lovely red ink using, instead of dragon's blood, this was a medieval recipe using Brazil wood. Um, rasped, you know, shredded like Brazil wood, which I have with my dye, with some of my, I use that as, in dyeing. Um, they made lovely inks, but the reason I bring them up is these inks, um, I've, I had recipes for these, very specific recipes, pretty much. Well, we had to re I, had to, I had to redact them, but they were pretty specific. Um, from a book published in 1558, and the reason I'm showing it is because the book, the name of the book was called A Book of Secrets, which I think that is so totally cool. We talk about witches and, and passing along things for hundreds of years. Same idea. Well, the people was the person that wrote that book uh, kiss of a wit being a witch now. That was a man. I think that wrote that book. No, no won't go there. But anyway, I, so my point, the only reason other for bringing this up is to tell you I've had experiences in making ink in the past. So I thought making a, a bath blood ink was going to be relatively simple. I know what goes in it. And I thought I was going to be able to do it pretty simply. It was a little bit of a struggle. Only in that I got a result that I kind of like. I do like the result. And I'll show you, here's the result I got. And I'll show you that in the, in the video. But it was a struggle to get there. Because if you divide by the proportions of how much of the ingredients you want to put in there, it's just not to be found in many places. Some people will give you very specific proportions, but when you go to use them, it, it's not right. I can't, I don't know, I can't justify the results. So I'm going to work harder from this in the future after I get through this this busy time and um, try to develop a good recipe for all of these things: dragon splitting, um, bat splitting, at least. I don't know. I don't really use dove's blood, but I'll look into it and see. And if I get a good recipe for them, I will pass it on to you. In the meantime, you can buy it. I want to know you can buy it. This came from a company, a local company, people that I know here, Dragon Marsh in, in Riverside, which they sell online. Uh, it's called Dragon Marsh. Dragon Marsh. But a lot of people sell it. And it's a lovely ink and it works well. Um, but I don't know what's in it. I don't know what's in it. And it's so red that I'm not sure. The red coloring, you know, doesn't really come... Like, my red that I got from Brazil Red is a really pretty, about as true red as you can get. But it's, it has a little brown tinge to it. So I'm not sure. I think a lot of this has artificial things in it. I'm not saying Dragon Marsh uses artificial stuff. And there's no big deal about using artificial stuff if it means a lot to have the color. And I, I don't want to judge. I just, you know, for my personal practice, you know how I am about things like that. I prefer things to be as organic as possible. I would rather have something like this that I got, got my results or my results of my nice brown, <laughs> rich brown ink that I know how it was made, what it was made from. That holds more power for me than something I can buy. But this is really good in a pinch and it's not expensive. This was $2.95 for an ounce and I know now today I think they sell it for probably $3.95. This is, I've had this long time because I don't really use it too often. It goes a long way. It goes a long way. So anyway, I'm going to put the video up and watch it just to give you an idea of what I did. Um, the inks, first of all, all get they're all basically the same recipe, but then the the bath blood has the addition of some more recipes. They all seem to start both of these, at least dragon's blood and bath blood, starts out relatively the same using dragon's blood incense resin. The resin, drag, dragon's blood resin. Um, they use gum arabic. I'll show you the 
as a binder. They use, uh, this uses myrrh as well. There is alcohol in it and um, a lot of people use isopropyl alcohol. I have had a lot of people, when I learned how to make this, one of the math, one of the most respected expert, at least locally here for us in inks and calligraphy and stuff like that, uses um, port wine for one of his dark inks. And, oh, <laughs> he passes it around and people are just looking and examining the ink and smelling it when we're in a class and people don't, can I get another whiff of that ink? It smells so good. But the only other caution I want to tell you, if you're going to buy something like these inks or make something like these things, you need a dip pen. Don't try to use a calligraphy, well, you can use a nib, a nib with a nib, you know, calligraphy pen. But they're very corrosive on the nib. So, the, and they don't work so well. The glass pens, you know, those pens are the ones that work the best. And usually most places that sell the inks will sell those pens. And you're going to see what I mean because that's what I use when I made mine coming up in the cliff. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. I'll show you the clip. The recipe that we're using today, I've not made before. So we'll see how it works out. But it takes, it's a very simple recipe, which takes equal parts, um, equal parts of dragon's blood, resin, and gum arabic, which is your, uh, that's what, uh, the binding agent, I believe, I'm not sure. And one half a part, one half part of myrrh. Okay, those are the those are the three powders that go into it, and we're, what we did, what I've done, is I took the dragon's blood incense, um, which comes, you know, I buy it, I buy it in lump form. I took about it was about half as that, a little, it was a smaller piece than that that I that I ground up in my mortar using my mortar and pestle, and I weighed that. I weighed it on my little scale, and I found it to be two tenths of an ounce. And then I ground up some myrrh resin, some myrrh resin in the spice grinder that I use for dyeing purposes only, not for food, because it is like rocks. It is like rocks to grind. And I used half as much myrrh, so I used one tenth of, one tenth of an ounce of myrrh to two tenths of an ounce of, <laughs> of dragon's blood. And then I put them in, and then I put them in this little piece of a, half of a can, okay? So I have nothing in the bottom but that, okay? Now before I add this, the recipe tells me, well, it's not really a recipe. I would share it, but it's, it's bits of recipes that I put together, <laughs> to be honest. I, I've made inks before, like I've said, so I'm, I, this is my best guess. This is my best guess finding what I could. Okay, so I have boiled some water in my kettle and I'm just going to add enough of this water. I don't want to add too much. Just enough of this water to form a bit of a paste out of these dry resins. Of This is only, again, this is only my myrrh and my dragon's blood. So I'm just adding a little bit at a time I don't want to go too far. That might be enough. I just wanted, the idea is to dissolve my resins in, in that water and to make paste. And I apologize that you can't really see what I'm doing. But I'll show you what I have. And I'm using this wooden spoon handle because I don't want to put my spoons But I, I'm kind of just getting it to the consistency. I want it to be wet, not crumble. I want it to stay together. But I do, and it's right now, it's, I don't think you can see. I'm not sure. I don't think you can see that. All of the part, there's a little bit of dry left. I could maybe force it to all be wet, but it's just the tiniest bit crumbly. So I'm going to add just one drop if I can. 
If I go too far, I'll be sorry. One drop, that was probably two drops. And now I can get it all the, oh, I don't see any dry bits left. But it, it will stick together. If I try to stick it together in one place, it kind of will. Not permanently, it'll, it'll crumble up all apart. But anyway, I have it, I have it like a paste. Maybe I could go a little more. Maybe I could go just a little bit more. I poured it into this because this pours well. I could not, I wasn't going to chance pouring it out of my kettle. Okay, now, it's it looks wetter. It's like the consistency of, what would I say? I don't know. It'll, it'll stay together for sure. It's a little wet, but I don't see any water. The water is all being held by the, by the resin. It's not, there's no extra water anywhere in the in the bottom of the can okay so that is that um, let me see if I can clean up the handle I don't know if this is a good idea or not because I want to use the spoon when I was adding the the resin after I weighed the after I weighed the dragon's butt and I was taking it out of the morning pestle before I put it in here I think I estimate it was like three spoons of this maybe three spoons so when I go to add this if I want the same amount I'm going to probably add three spoons of this powder to um, to this it seems like a lot to me but that's what it says that's what it says so we're gonna follow directions and see what that is but I'm gonna let that cool just a second I guess it is kind of cool. I also have the fan blowing on it. And I'm going to um Oh, now Oh, it says I can add I can add the gum and then I can stir in more water. So that's what I'm going to do. Okay, before I put in the alcohol. So I'm hoping the fan I'm going to do it here so the fan doesn't blow. I'm going to do about three spoons, just three levels, whoops, three level spoons of this. There's one. So I have about the same. That was two, and that was three. Now, if I stir, Try to get that in there. I'm going to need some more water. Again, I don't want too much because remember, I'm going to put my alcohol in it. I just want to get that. I just want to get all that worked in. And again, this is hot water that I boiled. It's starting to cool down a little bit, but it's okay. There we go. And now it's sort of like honey, like a nice thick honey. I'm going to try to smooth it out as much as I can. Trying to get down in the corners, the little nick, the little corners of the can, so I don't have any that'll stay in there and be lumpy. I'm going to strain this when we're done, but. Now, we know we get the dye, the color from the dragon's blood, um, which is red. It, it, this is what gives it the color. When I made my dye, my red dye, my period dye, I made, I got the red color from Brazil wood. But um, dragon's blood is lovely, and dragon's blood has a lot of other magical powers to it, so that's exactly my choice. But um, a lot of recipes will say after we add. Now we're gonna we're getting ready to add the alcohol. That's what I want to talk to you. 
because um, you can use, you need an alcohol that's at least 70% proof. You can use a, an isopropyl alcohol, which is, I think is 70% proof. Um, or you can use something more stronger, like a vodka. Many people at this point for bath's blood, I would say once you make the, the, the red a little darker, a little stronger, we'll add indigo, a little a couple drops of liquid indigo to it, which is a blue dye indigo. You know, indigo is what they dye for making blue jeans. Do people even say blue jeans anymore? I'm not sure. <laughs> jeans. Well, the blue ones, blue jeans. But indigo is expensive and that doesn't seem worth it to me. I don't think I would bother um, to do that. If you wanted to fortify it in another way, you could take, if you had any Dragon's Blood ink, I mean, which Dragon's Blood ink, which I have here, this is purchased, I didn't make this. But Dragon's Blood ink is, makes just about basically the same way as this. Um, you could add a few drops of that. I don't know what, again, I don't know who made, I know who made this, but I don't know. I know who I bought this from. I don't know if they made it or if, um, they purchased it, so I have no idea what's in this, so I don't, as far as fortifying my recipe, I don't know how good, what good that would do. All I do know is, I happen to have vodka, and better than that, better than that, I happen to have, like who doesn't, look at that, black vodka. <laughs> this is black vodka that I made actually last year, because we were having the black dinner party, and we, yes, of course, at a black dinner party, what color would you expect your vodka to be? You would expect it to be black. Okay, so I'm going to use black vodka in mine to fortify it. Now, it might make it really dark rather than the red. I don't know how red it's going to be to begin with anyway, but that's not, that's okay to me. I'm more, I'm looking at, and actually this has a purpley tinge to it. Like a reddish tinge to it. So, um, I'm more interested in the properties of the ink than the look of the ink. I mean, shouldn't we be? We're using it for magical purposes. We need to be interested in that. So now I'm just ready to add alcohol a little bit at a time. I'm using my dropper that you see me use before these that I collect from my poor cats and always need antibiotics. I'm just going to add a drop a little bit at a time. So I get the right consistency to um, have an ink that I can write with, which means we do not want it thick, too thick. We do not want it too thin. It has to be able to, to um, be taken up by my pen. So what is the consistency of ink? Well, we could look at another ink and see. This is pretty runny. It's just a matter of experimentation, actually. Now, if you added more water, you would need less alcohol. If you added more less water, you would need more alcohol. I'm not sure of the effect of the ink, how the result, the result of your ink. I would say that you would have to experiment. And this is something that I, see I still have a lot of residue, resi, residue. So I'm gonna add some more. that much. I'm going to need a lot of red. I'm going to, I want it thin. I want to be able to, to go up in the pen. And see, it's just gloppy there. I don't know if you can see that. It's so hard on a round table, but it's just too thick for me. But it looks pretty brown. I'm just saying it looks pretty brown, but do not be fooled by what color it looks like. 
here. Now, I do know that these things tend to thicken up a little bit as in time. So if it comes out too thin, you could just set it aside for a while and see if it thickens up. Because I think some of it evaporates, some of the alcohol will evaporate out of it. Let's see. So we're getting much richer, but it's still only coming in, in drops. I think I want it... I think I want it thinner. I hope you appreciate me doing all this experimenting for you. You learn by my mistakes. That's why I'm here. You can learn from my successes and you can learn from my mistakes. I know we're getting a lovely. I'm really starting to see a difference. Oh, now see it's starting to, it's starting to pour off of the spoon rather than drip. That's what we want. It has to be able to flow three, freely through the pen. Now, the thing about these pens, I'm gonna to try to use it with a glass pen. I have a glass pen here because I do know that these inks can be very corrosive in, in, in a, in a, with a dip pen, with a, a nib, with a nib, you know, metal nib. Unless you really are very, very good about cleaning out your nibs all the time because they can, it'll corrode. The period inks particularly, especially when we use um, a vinegar or a lot of those use vinegar or strong like wine, port wine or something like that. Um, see now, I'm starting to see very much runnier. Very much runnier. Let's see how this writes now. These pens, I know, have a sweet spot in them, like most dip pens, that you have to find. But you need to keep it also, you don't want to keep it straight up and down. You want to keep it on an angle when you write. Let's see what we can get. Let's see, I put too much in there. It's still a little thick. And unlike a nib pen, you just write. In your normal handwriting, you don't have to worry about your the calligraphy we worry about. I'm just going to go over this and darken this up a little bit. So you can see this. It has a nice color now. And I think it has the consistency that I want. I'm sorry I can't give you a better recipe. But it's just a matter of experimentation. I will, there we go. Beware. <laughs> it's just a matter of experimenting and seeing, you know, what works for you. Um, if you want me to do another video, just let me know. And I will, um, on scribal tools, um, how to cut quills. And I can give you some other recipes. Maybe by then I can get a, a pretty better accurate recipe of what I want to do to make to make this, but for right now, it works. And there's my batch blood ink. Okay? Thank you so very much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.